Um, if you are looking for the Project Archivist skill session, you are in the right place. If you are not, wrong room. All right, so today we are going to be doing an introduction to the role of Project Archivist for EPIX teams. My name is Megan Sapp Nelson, and I am a professor of libraries and information sciences for Purdue University Libraries. Uh, and I am the advisor for the Project Archivists, who are not a team, but who are all carrying out a similar role across a number of different teams. And so you get your own advisor who is not affiliated with any particular team. Uh, so we're going to start today just by talking about what Project Archivists are, what they do, talk about some of the tools that are at your disposable, and then we'll spend the last part of the session talking about what some of the best practices for documentation are. So we're going to start by talking about two case studies for why documentation is important. Can you all hear me? I just want to make sure. All right. So the first is City Core Towers. Have any of you heard of City Core Towers before? Okay. It's in New York City, and it's famous because it's cantilevered over a church. So the church pre-existed it. It was built in the 1700s. It's a beautiful, quaint little church. And the only way that the skyscraper could be built was if the church itself remained intact. It was on the National Register of Historic Places. And so the design solution that the particular, the designer of the tower came up with was to put the supports not on the four corners of the building, as you would expect from a rectangle, but in the middle of the sides. So when you put the, middle, put the supports in the middle of the sides, that changes the forces of the structure dramatically, right? So they built the tower. It's very cool looking because the corners hang out over the church. So there's a triangle dangling out over the church. Um, but when a graduate student at Princeton started looking at the documentation, the construction documentation for City Core Towers, she became concerned that quartering winds, when they were as the building was constructed, would cause the design to collapse. So they now had a building that not only was um, hanging over existing structures, but was now towering over blocks and blocks. Well, she took it to the design firm that built the building, and the uh, the individual who was in charge of the design, Le Mezier, went back and looked at the construction documentation again and figured out not what she had found, but there was an additional problem that he had not taken into consideration with the original design, which was that when U.S. Steel built the building, they made the decision to go ahead and bolt the joints instead of welding them to save money and to save time in order to deliver the structure on time. Well, in the process, they weakened the interior supports because the way the building was, is actually supported is um, cross-shaped beams on the inside skeleton of the building. And those beams were not going to be strong enough to counter those quartering winds. And it was the start of hurricane season when he figured this out. So he did the right thing, according to uh, the engineering code of ethics. He immediately contacted the building owners and they contacted the city of New York. They contacted the Red Cross. They made plans to evacuate blocks and blocks of people if they had to. And they started immediately going back and welding the joints together at night when no one else was in the building. They finished it up as a hurricane came into New York Harbor. So it was a very near miss. The problem was identified because existing construction documentation allowed it to be identified. So that's like a big deal that the documentation was kept. Well, what about when you are in a small project, 
right? Why should we care about the documentation for an EPICS team? So I served as an advisor for EPICS teams for 14 years. And I saw multiple problems with the lack of documentation on an EPICS team. I once had a team that started over from scratch because the previous teams had not documented their design. And so the teams in the future couldn't figure out what the team had been doing. They couldn't figure out what the design decisions were. They couldn't figure out where the existing code was. And so they just started over. So that team lost three semesters worth of work because they just couldn't figure out what they were doing in previous semesters. There's also the problem of beginning at the beginning of the semester. So when you have new people coming on to the team, the best case scenario is that there's really good design documentation so those people can read, the, those students can read the documentation, they can get up to speed really quickly, they can find all of the files very quickly and orient themselves so that they can immediately start to help produce new work for the team. However, on, in many cases, those transition documents don't exist. And so new teams flounder at the beginning of the semester. They're trying to figure out, where is everything? What do I need to know to get started? Where did they leave off? All of those things can be reduced if you have good design documentation. And then there's project maintenance. When you deliver a project, the project can, especially if it's a physical object, it can sit and interact with the public for years and years, five, six, seven years. No one who worked on that project originally is around Purdue anymore. Everyone has graduated, except maybe the advisor, but even advisors turn over for Epix teams. And then those projects come back for maintenance. The only lasting artifact from the original design is the documentation that will allow for maintenance on that project. And if you don't have the documentation, then once again, you have that, that problem of a team essentially trying to redesign or, re or backwards design from an existing artifact to try to figure out how design decisions were made in order to repair something, which means that it takes three to four times longer to repair the object. And so the, the public, who is supposed to be interacting with the design at that point in time, can't. And then finally, good documentation just reduces stress on the team members. So whenever you have good documentation, that means that your team members are able to communicate with each other well. It means that design decisions are clear, which means that there's no going around in circles about did we decide this or did we not decide this? Why did we decide this? Why two semesters ago did we select this programming language that now doesn't work with our server? All of these questions can be answered easily using the documentation. If you don't have the design documentation, then it makes it very difficult for the teams to be able to communicate with each other at the present time, but also to communicate across to the future with future team members. So documentation solves it. The root problem in these, in these case studies are identified in documentation. Epix needs similar documentation for Epix projects, and particularly because Epix are long-term projects that last far longer than any individual team member. So you need to be able to rely on the documentation to have a lifespan that is longer than any individual team member on the team. There's no, the documentation becomes the memory of the team. You need to be able to enable future teams to troubleshoot. You have to deliver the project at some point, or otherwise you have a significant failure. And you need to be able to maintain your projects. So the project archivist role is all about ensuring that the documentation is collected and maintained. You want to ensure on-time delivery. You want to prevent personnel turnover because of 
bad documentation and you want to help preserve the project in the face of changes in technology. So let's talk a little bit about what responsibilities fall on project archivists. The project archivist works as a team with the team leader and the advisor. The project archivist is really focused on preserving the documentation and those design decisions that are made throughout the semester. The project lead or team lead, those people are about making sure that the design is moving through the design life cycle. You're about making sure that the decisions that are made as those moving through the design life, life cycle, making sure those decisions are captured. So you're working in tandem with those people. We have some resources in EPICS that will help you to do that. The first is the project documentation template. And other, sometimes other teams specify a different outline, but one way or another, you are going to be responsible for turning in, at the end of the semester, a document that is a compendium of information about the progress that you made on the project throughout the semester. Generally, your team will be using the project documentation template. And then there is a best practices, hints, and tips document for project archivists. And then you want to be proactively working with your leadership and your team in documentation related tasks. It can be relatively passive. It can be leading conversations during the team meeting. It can just be encouraging compliance with expectations around documentation submission. Right? So if the documentation is due in week three for week four notebook checks, you just want people to go ahead and remind people, OK, don't forget, you're going to be updating your design documents this week or your notebooks this week. Here's some ideas for what you might include. Here's how you might document a design decision. So encouraging the compliance for making sure the documentation gets done. And then there's accountability for the team as a whole. So making sure that the, the design decisions are getting documented on an ongoing basis throughout the semester, rather than saving it up just for mid-semester design review and final design review. Because A, nobody likes doing those large projects right before they're due. It's a hassle for everyone. And B, you forget what design decisions you've made and the context. So you miss things if you do that. So trying to hold the team accountable for a cumulative writing of the document throughout the semester. So there are a number of different tools that are out there for capturing documentation. And the tools that are appropriate for your team are going to change depending on your team and what your project is. Now, if your team has had a previous project archivist, they may have already selected the tools that are appropriate for your team. It's worth investigating what the solutions are that are already in place for your team. But if you have a team that has not had an active project archivist before, you may need to select tools that are appropriate. The first tool that is very common for Epix teams is Progress Issues Goals, the PIG. How many of you have seen a pig done in your team? Okay, two hands, three hands, four hands. All right, so I'm not going to go into great depth about what a progress issues goals call out is during a team meeting. The big thing to know about progress issues and goals is not just that you want to hear the progress, but you, as the project archivist, want to encourage the people around the table to identify the design decisions that they made during that week as part of their progress. By doing that, it makes it into the official record of the team. It's one tiny little tweak to PIG 
that makes a big difference because usually the team leader is sitting up front typing notes as you go around the circle and that way those design decisions get captured every week. The next tool that is very common is decision matrices. How many of you have implemented a decision matrix in your team? Two. So three, okay. So decision matrices are a tool that are extremely helpful in engineering and are not used frequently enough. Decision matrices allow you to gather all of the constraints for a specific, specific solution, specific options that are on the table, and then weight them versus the different, cons the different constraints and the different options that are available. Decision matrices A provide a level of accountability and documentation for how the decision was made for a design decision. B provide transparency for future teams, but also for external design reviewers and des internal design reviewers to understand how the desi decision was design decision was made. And C provide a legacy archive documentation for what the options were originally. So remember that team that originally had the team, they made all these decisions, they didn't document anything, and then three semesters down the road, they started from scratch because they didn't understand what the team had done. That problem would have been solved had they done a decision matrix where they created a list of all of the options they had available to them, all of the constraints, and did a weighted matrix. Then the teams down the road would have understand, understood why they made the decisions they made, and they would have been able to follow the logic of the project much more clearly. Decision matrices are a really important tool, and they should be used more frequently. Plus, um, you get a lot of credit with external and internal design reviewers when you use them. Another tool that has been used with great success for Epix teams are Google Forms. So Google Forms are a free tool through the Google Suite, and they allow you to make, basically, they look like surveys. But the way that Epix teams use them is to create an ongoing diary for the team of design decisions. So basically, the Google Form looks like date, name, design decision, and then sometimes it'll be like who, what, when, where, why. Sometimes it'll be just be like the context for the design decision. And the expectation is that every time somebody on the team creates, makes a design decision in the semester, they go into the Google form and they input it. And then you end up with a spreadsheet of all design decisions for the entire semester. It makes creating your design template a whole lot easier when you have everybody in the team invested in using the Google form. And we have teams here in Epix who have been doing this for years at this point, and it's very, very successful because it is a very streamlined way of collecting all the information in one spot. Uh, it, it also becomes the basis for the pigs discussion in the following week because if nobody uploaded anything, then you haven't made any progress. If people are uploading things, then it becomes the beginning of the discussion for progress issues goals. Uh, the next tool that you have is actually a really good practice, and you'll see it a lot of times in, uh, in industry, but it's also helpful just as you are getting used to raising the quality of documentation in your team and is peer review of documentation. So in the case of peer review of documentation, what you're having people do is update their individual notebooks or perhaps you have multiple projects on your Epix team, have the individual projects upload, uh, update their team documentation and then you exchange it 
to other individuals or other teams that haven't seen that documentation yet and you offer constructive feedback. This, this increases the level of quality of the documentation, but it also allows other individuals on the team to get to know the details of the design that's going on within the team. So you come to know what individuals are doing, you come to know what other teams are doing, you get good quality suggestions on both the quality of the documentation, but also on design. So what are they doing? Oh, have you tried this? Um, and so it's a good practice to put into place. It doesn't have to be a long, pro a long intervention. Um, when this, the project archivists meet twice in the semester and the second one is a peer review of documentation, we do 10 minute rounds. You can do a really useful peer review of documentation in 10 minutes because you're just giving useful targeted feedback on a document for an intended purpose. So you just have to give a prompt. Today we are working on identifying the design decisions that have happened since mid-semester review. Can we see them in the document? Is there enough context to understand why they were made? You can easily do that review in 10 minutes because it's got a date that provides the constraint and then you have specific things that you're looking for within the documentation. For software code teams, a key tool is Java docs or comment aggregating software. And every single different programming language has a different comment aggregating software. Um, there's markdown languages now that act as comment aggregating software. So if you're using R, Python has PyPy, Jupyter Notebooks has a comment aggregating feature. Uh, so any of these, you can create your documentation as you code. So there's no reason to do it twice if you're on the software code team when you can do it once. You just have to do a really good job of commenting your code. And similarly, to peer review of documentation, you can create software code rubrics for your team. What is the expected level of quality for your code? You can create a rubric for that, and then you can look at individual's code against that rubric and provide feedback for how that code could be improved. Uh, computer's frozen. Okay. So we're going to talk for a minute about the design document template. Have you all seen this the design document template? Got a couple of yeses, some confusion. All right. So the main thing to realize about the design document template is it's organized around the stage of your design life cycle for your project. So you find the stage that your design, your, your design is in or your project's in and you probably have an ongoing document already set up. But if you don't, for some reason, you can go to design documents under team documents. And then over here, there it is, is the design document template. And it looks like this. They want you to put a pretty picture on it in the project name. And then each section is, has a specific aspects that they want you to fill in. So for instance, for conceptual design, they want to talk about the resources you used, concept generation, prototyping, concept convergence, and proposed solution. Uh, and then there's an outline on each page with prompt questions that you fill out. So that's the design lifecycle template or this design document template. So we also have the design centered process activities, which I will show you the link for in a little bit. And basically it's a list of activities that are organized around the design lifecycle as well. And you can use them in tandem as project archivists. 
And basically, it's just a list of action items that you can take back to your team. If you are having trouble figuring out what to put in, like what documentation to put in each of the life each of the stages of the life cycle of your project, it will give you an idea. So for instance, if you need to figure out a way to get your team started up during the conceptual design phase, you could work with your team to organize files in a way that makes sense for the project. You could develop file naming conventions with the team. You can report design decisions weekly during the team meeting and record them. So all of those things are within the purview of the project archivist, right? So additionally, so we've got this one standardized template that Purdue, that Purdue Epics has. Then there are some of the advisors who are out there who have non-standard design documents. And it's specific to either the team circumstances or the advisor's specific preferences. So you want to communicate with the advisor you're working with about the expectations for the design documents. There are some that have industry-based templates. So a lot of times, if the advisor comes out of industry and maybe they're a project manager, so they want an a template that looks something like what they use at their particular workplace. And so you would use that template instead. There are some, or at least there used to be some advisors that used chemistry lab based templates. And so th those were like research based templates. So they basically all have the same content. They just don't quite follow the same outline. So you just want to be transparent with your advisor about which outline you're going to follow and make sure that you are aligning with it. OK. So the key for good, good documentation is making sure that the decision, the design decision, is captured. Well, it's good to understand process, the process doesn't make any sense if people don't understand the conclusion that you came to at the end of the process. Likewise, if you came to a conclusion and people don't understand the context for the decision that you came to, your dis documentation is also going to be really poor. So first, you want to know what was the decision that you made. If, if, you teach no if you teach your team nothing else, this is the slide to teach them. What was the decision that was made? And what was the context for the decision? So. We strongly recommend that if you, if a decision was, a design decision was made and it referenced standards for screw sizes, standards for tools, those include that information. That's context for how the decision was made. If you did benchmarking research on the web and found a variety of different possible solutions and use those to create your decision matrix, then you should create a resource list of those initial design ideas that you got by benchmarking on the web. Because that's the context for how the decision matrix was designed. Context is important because otherwise there's a leap of logic that people don't understand in the design document, and that's where people get confused. You're looking to include standards, literature searches, drawings and sketches from notebooks, code snippets. Anything that provides the context for the decision, you want to include in your design document. You also want to include anything that's measurable, observable characteristics of the decision. So it's not enough to say that we're going to use a one inch screw when you can have the exact dimensions of the screw, right? It's not enough to say that you, at the beginning of the project, you want to say we're going to do this project in metric or standard. That should be in the documentation somewhere. Because otherwise, you leave room for error in interpreting the, the drawings that you're doing and the specifications that are ultimately figured out. Right? That's measurable, observable characteristics of the design. These are some of the first things that people come up with, but it's not the only things. 
anytime you are coming up with more specificity,